be thankful to the fans because I think without them, empty stadium, we don't have that feel. Hello and welcome to What Matters. I'm Stephen Chia. That could be my future home. Orchard Road is just a few MRT stops away and my office in the business district, a mere 10 minute walk. It's always been a dream of mine to have an apartment in the city. That's where the action is and I wanted to be there. But as I looked around, I found that there were some things that I really liked and other things that I didn't. So is an apartment in the city really such a great buy? Let's find out. For an increasing number of Singaporeans, city living is a reality. Every year, more and more condominiums appear in the central area. City living seems to be the dream of many Singaporeans. Yeah, if I have, I got a chance to live in city, uh, I would like to live in city because uh, I'm type of urban boy, so I love city. Me, I, I like fast pace, you know, I'm very uh, competitive and I like the things that, you know, the convenience of it. Basically, it's convenience. If I could live in the city area, I would because it's um, near to everywhere. With its prime location and modern features, a city condominium is a great place to live in. However, there is one thing that's holding many Singaporeans back, and that's the cost. A small condominium in the east sells for around $500,000. Those in the Orchard area often sell for over a million dollars. But there's a new style of city apartment. Welcome to the Small Office Home Office, or Soho Apartment. Mr. Chia Boon Kwa is from Far East Organization, which is building the first Soho in Singapore. Now, Soho, it is certainly city living, but it's more than city living. Soho is not a home. It's neither an office. It is both. It offers uh, full flexibility in using it as an office and a home. A Soho unit maximizes space in an amazing way. The ceilings are high, so above the office, you can have a bedroom. Sliding doors take up less space than regular ones. Bathroom, kitchen, dining room, living room, home office and bedroom are placed in an area of less than 700 square feet. The result is an apartment that costs only about $800,000. Many of the foreigners and the locals bought it because they see it as an attractive uh, and an affordable investment. Because these people are busy, energetic business people, they are on the go a lot, they value uh, space, and uh, we make sure that every inch of the space that they are buying into is well used. City developments aim to attract energetic, cosmopolitan and affluent people. Danny Lefebois fits the bill perfectly. But instead of moving to the city, he prefers to live in Geylang. In his mid-40s, Danny is the founder and CEO of Alchemist Asia, a branding consultancy with clients all over the world. He could well afford to live in the city, so why doesn't he? Geylang has really uh, a very unique community. People come here because they love the food. And I think that that's really key to Geylang because the food gives you that feeling of authenticity where people have that nostalgia where they go back and say, well, this is the food I used to eat as a little kid. And I think that's very, also very important for Gaylan. More and more Singaporeans are discovering that they're not just paying for a roof over their heads, they're also paying for memories, atmosphere and culture. This could be one reason why there are over 10,000 unsold HDB flats in various new towns. People would rather move to areas they feel a genuine attachment to. A place like Robinson Key that's far out rather than places like Pongo or Sengkang that's, well, far out. There's an enormous demand for city living. If response to the Pinnacle project is anything to go by. City living is set to get even more exciting with the upcoming development of Marina Bay. The URA doesn't want such projects to turn the city into another overplanned part of Singapore. Plastic and unappealing. We've recently seen a number of interesting uh, mixed-use developments come up. Um, we've identified and sold a number of sites uh, which we've zoned as white sites. Now these sites uh, are where we can uh, 
accept a, a range of uh, different land uses. It could be developed for commercial or residential or hotel use or even a mix of uses. In spite of this developmental freedom, Danny is not sure whether the city will really become as authentic as it seeks to be. What Gay Line has is still community. Yeah? And community is not something, it's very hard to, to emulate that. Yeah? Um, in Gay Line, you, know, you, you still have those relationships. You still see the, the guy going down the street with you know, his collection of carton boxes or whatever. And you still see the, the interaction with the people. And I think that is what makes Gay Line special because it is a community of, of people who are from that era. And, you know, the new developments are basically geared toward the expat and to the, to the high-end market, you know, looking at, you know, wireless buildings completely. So I think it's the best of technology. Whether it's able to capture the spirit of it or not is, you know, is another issue. The city, however, has its own culture. And while it may be different from Geelong, it's no less exciting. This place will be surrounded uh, by uh, exciting population centres. Uh, up the river, uh, there is this uh, upper middle class uh, and very international uh, residents. And then just across the Yu Tong Sing Street is a financial district. There are 50,000 working executives down there. And on our right is uh, Chinatown. All these uh, population centres will add a significant a cosmopolitan lifestyle. Buying property isn't just about location and convenience. It's also about community. Maybe that's what makes a house a home. So before you buy that property, think about what it is you really want. Are you looking for that buzz and excitement that comes with the city? Or would you rather have something more tranquil and quiet? Either way, a home is only what you make of it. And once you step in the front door, you could be anywhere in the world. We're going for a break now. We'll see you in a while. Later in the program, keeping your children safe at home. Still watching? Well, you'd better be, because we're talking about football. It's official. Goal 2010 has been scrapped by the Football Association's new chief. Instead, he's come up with a new goal, for the Singapore team to become top dog in the ASEAN region within the next five years. And that is indeed good news because it means we just might bring back to life the excitement and passion we once had for our national team. Remember the dream team in the early 90s? Well, why has that changed? And what is it that makes Singaporeans burn for passion for teams like Manchester United and not for teams like Home United? The Kalang Roar. Tens of thousands of screaming fans. A jubilant home team bringing back the Malaysian Cup. A decade after, the fever that had gripped local soccer fans now seem like fading memories. These days, the raw fans at matches like Singapore Cup and S League pale in comparison. While there are the die-hard supporters of local clubs, turnout and atmosphere have fallen by a long stride compared to Malaysian Cup matches. Initiatives to boost local soccer, like the officially sanctioned Gold 2010 to secure a World Cup qualification, sometimes fail embarrassingly. At the most recent World Cup qualifier, Singapore lost to Oman by a dismal seven goals. An official announcement of the scrapping of the 2010 deadline followed. Is local football really on the decline? When we look back at the 70s, 80s and 90s, we had the Malaysia Cup, uh, which had a very proud tradition. We have been playing in the Malaysia Cup for the last 40, 50 years, so there is a big uh, history behind that tournament. So when you compare that with our local S League, uh, you don't see the same fervor, the same fever. Uh, and that's primarily because when we played the, in the Malaysia Cup, we were always united as one team behind Singapore, playing against the Malaysian state teams. But now in the S-League, uh, well, we've got 8, 10, sometimes 12, all Singapore-based teams. And fans are finding it very difficult to, to see which team they support. I think they check because they play a very good uh, soccer. They got a very fast counter attack. Tonight, I believe it'll be Croatia. Why? Well, because uh, they click more better in the team. Whether it's a fancy area, footwork of the Brazilians the or the precision of the Germans, or even the smoldering looks of the Italians, foreign footballers and clubs have gripped the attention of soccer fans here. 
I think they're... So devoted are these fans, some have gone on to set up fan clubs. Like the Liverpool Fan Club, which pays homage to one of England's most popular football clubs. International matches like the current Euro 2004 matches never fail to attract ardent local fans. Many think nothing of foregoing sleep to cheer for players in countries not their own. Many even come decked out in club colours, like this group of Man United fans, who make no bones about why they prefer them to local players. Each club has their own star player, so that will definitely create something where people want to go down and see that particular player, you know, showing off his skills you know, and, and that kind of talent. Now, um, it, it really depends, again, it's, it's the club, whether they can afford, it goes down to, you know, money, dollars and cents. Uh, you say, you talk about glamour, I think you need it both on field and off field. Because Beckham is a great example of glamour on the field and glamour off the field. So that's what's making the whole football a lot more exciting. Uh, because uh, personalities and a brand and all that comes together. Like. In the world of big league football, football players are also money spinning celebrities whose faces grace posters and sell collectibles. The closest Singapore ever got to a celebrity home team was the dream team of the early 90s. The most famous among them, soccer legend Fandiyama. As their former coach shares, their celebrity status sold albums and drew crowds wherever they played. Those were, were absolutely fantastic days. Um, we had such great following. Even our training sessions were attended by a few thousand spectators because it was like uh, we were the, the, the people of, of the time. We had crowds lining up uh, knowing that we are going to make an appearance, say, at a shopping centre. Crowds thronging the place, trying to be there, to try and touch the players. It was a very good feeling. The dream team members were the past icons in local football. Many like Fandi and Kadir Yahaya have moved on from being football stars to coaching new talents that will hopefully fill their shoes down the road. Still, the memory of how Singaporeans once supported the local team is deeply etched in their memories. I think the, the fans love the team because we are together, even though we have uh, I think one or I think it's two foreigners, Abbas, Alistair, and maybe I can't remember one more, Jan Jung. But they feel Singaporean. So the unity was there and we entertain the crowd every week. A hero of the, the we are like a national hero huh? by playing in front of a big crowd, you know, getting about 60,000 every match and then the, the media hype up, you know, the attention that we got. Sometimes they are displeasure from the fans, we didn't perform, but that's uh, meaning that they are concerned about us and I think we should be thankful to the fans, yeah? Because I think without them, empty stadium, we don't have that feel, you know, the atmosphere you need to feel. Definitely, definitely, because as a footballer, it's a, it's a dream and it's, it's like a, you have to play in a big arena, a big atmosphere, you have big crowds, you know, people cheering you up when you are down, when you are up, you know. So, the fan support, the media support, the sponsors and everything play a very big role in football. Such support is yet to be seen for the current crop of players. A few names have been bandied around in the Young Lions as promising faces to watch for. But none has yet command the same drawing power as the previous stars. But it could just be a matter of time. 20-year-old Baihaki and Ridwan have just two years of professional experience between them but are already in the national team and they want to be judged on their own terms. I don't expect them to support us like last time, you know, say like 60,000 over, like people climbing up the stadium and all this and you can see people fainting. We'll be proud of it, like, you know, if we can get water of it. Yeah, but on top of that, we have to perform, that's what he said, and to obtain results for a national team in order for people to come back to watch us, you know. And we want people to come back to watch their idols play, you know, one day. To obtain, for them to expect another dream team like Singapore used to have is... Very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> won't, 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 won't be the same, uh. but to have a dream team which is different, likely, like more like a youngster's team, then they, they will see it someday uh, in years to come. Goal 2010 or even 2020 may be impossible deadlines, but the future of local football is not set in stone. Soccer fever is hot among the young, judging from students at the crop of soccer academies here. 
With the right combination of talent and attitude, the World Cup could be within reach of a future generation. I enjoy it because you get to kick a ball and keep yourself entertained instead of sitting around. I like it because you get to play. Um, I like it because um, it's you get to play lots of matches and then it and you get to meet with lots of other people. At former S League coach David O'Connor's soccer school, local kids make up only 10% of students. He says it's not because local talent is lacking, but because there's a perception football doesn't make a worthy profession. Local kids also tend to start too late in the game, but he says things are slowly changing. I'm trying now to get as many locals um, to attend our academy as possible. Uh, we're starting to get, get them coming, uh, but remember also I go around to the schools, I go into schools, so I'm dealing with the locals all the time. Um, there's a different culture, there's a different mindset. For years now, the, the, the thoughts in Singapore is get them when they're 14 and 15, and that's, that's wrong, you know. You've got to get them, get them at three, get them at four. As soon as they start wanting to kick a soccer ball, then you must get them. Just like our friend over there, football is here to stay. Not just for this generation, but for generations to come. Will there be another dream team? Why not? It could be in the making right now. But one thing we do know for sure is that to get there, we have to give football the necessary support and dedication. For a start, I say let's just get out there and watch some games. We're going for a break now, but stick around. at least on the field, to a common cause. Off the field, tensions would still ignite in bitter conflict. But in Ireland, the class game, a creature of school field and college quadrangle, of Ulster farmers and professional Republican men, would bizarrely survive the battles of nationalism and nation building. At the outbreak of the First World War, the class cohorts of the English public schools were summoned into battle. The playing fields have been a training ground, and a rugby generation marched as officers into the tragedies of trench warfare. Ronald Poulton Palmer, old rugbyan and graduate of Balliol College, Oxford, had played for England 17 times before the war. In 1914, he captained his country, scoring four tries on what would be his last international appearance. A year later, he was cut down by a sniper's bullet at the age of 25. He was one of 27 English, 30 Scottish, 13 Welsh, and nine Irish rugby internationals who died during the war. Men returning home from the front were promised a land fit for heroes, but the very unheroic 20s and 30s were not to be a time of national unity. Industrial conflict and economic depression set one class against another. One of the most important things to say, I think, at the end of the First World War is that it's a period of hugely intensified class conflict. There's a great deal of anxiety about organized working class militants, um, the main strikes of 1919 and 1921, and leading up to the general strike of 1926. And this is a time when the middle class, I think, are more afraid of working class gains and perhaps at any period on either side. And one of the ways in which this is expressed, it's not the only way, but one of the ways in which this is expressed, is that an increasing number of those schools, grammar schools and lesser private and public schools, which had previously played soccer, in a way take fright. They want to draw the wagons up in a circle, make sure that these middle class values and these middle class social contacts are preserved and they go over to playing rugby in large numbers. And one way this feeds into uh, the structure of rugby in England is that it's in the 1920s that more clubs are founded than in any other decade. And a very large number of those clubs are old boys clubs of schools which a generation or two before wouldn't have played rugby. The interwar years saw the high point of the amateur game in England. Almost 400 clubs were formed in this period. The English Rugby Club was now a treasured part of English suburban life. 
Clubs and players relished their access to an establishment world. Many grammar school parents, many grammar school boys aspired. They aspired to do well. They aspired as education became a little more open, more accessible. As Oxford and Cambridge became more accessible, as there were more universities available, how do you aspire? What are the trappings that help you aspire? If you were a bright uh, grammar school boy, you needed some of the other trappings that went with that. You might not be able to be a member of the golf club, but you certainly could play rugby football, could join the local rugby club, and could be seen as part of a community of upper middle class professional people. It was what professional people did. With their roles of honour, initiation ceremonies and club shields, even the newest suburban rugby club now boasted the trappings of tradition. There was strong emphasis on singing, bar games, hijinks and male camaraderie. The rugby club, with its school uniform of blazer and tie, was an old boy network for any old boy who needed a social passport. This newfound confidence was translated at international level where England's grammar school boys and varsity educated men won four grand slams during the 20s. Their dominance of the game was challenged only by Scotland, who, during the same period, vied with England for rugby glory. But in this period of triumphant amateurism, it came as no surprise that they emulated English success. The Scottish rugby mirrored the English game. Throughout the 20s and 30s, Scottish teams were filled with the products of the public schools and Oxbridge colleges. Most famous of these was the celebrated 1924 team, whose entire three-quarter line was made up of Oxford Blues. Typical of this generation of mercurial Scottish rugby players was Ian Smith, flying winger, prolific tri-scorer, and formerly of Winchester and Oxford. Smith wore the thistle with pride, but the backgrounds and social experience of such heroes were hardly an expression of indigenous Scottish culture. They shared the same world view as their English counterparts. Rugby had found a place in the small towns and scattered communities of the Scottish borders and was enthusiastically taken up by artisans and farmers. But the game in Scotland had largely followed the class imperatives of the game south of the border. The game of urban Scotland, of Red Clydeside, of the Fifeshire Coalfields, of the Scottish working classes in general was soccer. And the gentlemen of the Scottish Rugby Union heaved a grateful sigh of relief that it was so. The converse was true.